Welcome to the Convocation Interview Series, hosted by Berea College and produced by Apollon, the undergraduate e-journal. Apollon's mission is to publish superior examples of undergraduate humanities research, as well as fully utilize the e-journal format through image, text, and sound. In the spirit of this mission, the Convocation Interview Series provides Berea College students the opportunity to engage in conversation with a diverse calendar of speakers and performers. The expertise of these speakers and performers provides a valuable resource, as well as the opportunity to connect the role of the public intellectual to the college environment. Hello and welcome to the second installment of the Fall 2011 Convocation Interview Series. My name is David Cornett. I am the coordinator of the Convocation Interview Series. Today we are fortunate enough to have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Andrea Smith. Dr. Smith is a Cherokee intellectual feminist, intellectual feminist and anti-violence activist whose work focuses on violence against women of color, especially Native American women. She earned a bachelor's degree in comparative study of religion at Harvard University. She then earned her master's of divinity at the Union Theological Seminary, and then a PhD in history of consciousness from UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Smith is also the author of several books, including Conquest, Sexual Violence, and American Indian Genocide, which won the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award. She is the co-founder of Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, as well as a founding member of the Boarding School Healing Project, and was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. Today, our student interviewers are Lamwe Muzima, Kirsten Jones, and Katherine Collins. Would you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, my name is Kirsten. I am a senior, Women and Gender Studies and African and African American Studies, double major from Cincinnati. Okay, my name is Luamwe Muzima. I'm an international student from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm a political science major and peace and social justice minor. I'm Catherine Collins. I am a senior Women and Gender Studies major and sociology minor, and I'm from Somerset, Kentucky. All right. Kirsten, would you begin with our first question? Okay. My question is, Dr. Smith, how do you define feminism? Well, one, just call me Andy. <laughs> I'm okay. not a doctor person. But anyway, um, well, feminism, I, I don't feel the need to have a constrained point of view. So to me, it's more interesting to have the debate about what feminism could be in different contexts. But for me personally, I tend to focus it on um, it's less to me about women per se and more about an, an, a politics around how under, ha, understanding how patriarchy helps enforce other forms of social domination and then a commitment towards dismantling patriarchy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you think the U.S. has attained a um, satisfying level as far as um, human rights and um, gender equality are concerned? No. <laughs> I mean, I think the U.S. is uh, founded on slavery and genocide, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally illegitimate. Uh, can I delete this later? Anyway, <laughs> I'll just say what I think, but please delete this one. I'm getting in trouble. But in any case, um, um, no, this is, this, uh, the U.S. Is, is a genocidal project. It would not exist without the genocide of Native people, right? And I think to the extent that we assume it must always continue to exist, then you must apologize for that genocide or assume that it's okay. But I think more importantly than the U.S., I just see the U.S. as one nation state, and I don't feel like we need to live under nation state forms of governance. I think we can kind of, as I was saying before, unleash our imaginations about different forms of governance that would be under different models. So I don't know that the U.S. is necessarily worse than other nation states. I think any nation state, given the chance, ends up with this kind of system if it can. Um, but we have to ask ourselves the question, is this the way we want to live, or is there different forms of... Uh, governance that we could have in a global scale that would be more equitable and just. And of course the problem we have the human rights is that the human rights language sounds good but it's often used as a bludgeon against other countries, right? That one excuses the human rights violations going on in the US, you know, and, but also then gets used as a weapon of, uh, to excuse colonial domination in other places. Oh, they're backwards, that's why we need to go take over their countries. Meanwhile, we just executed somebody who's, you know, who's guilt is very doubtful despite all this. You know, Troy Davis is recently executed and we don't see that as a fundamental human rights problem. What do you, can I, can I ask what do you think? <laughs> I, 
I guess I'll start. Um, I do not think that the U.S. has obtained the level of gender equality or, you know, respect for human rights. I think the U.S. has, in fact, regressed to a point where it makes me scared for the next generation. Just thinking of, like, the level of just, you know, blatant racism and sexism and just, you know, this imper this neo-imperial colonialism that we do with oh, you as you know the Middle East can't have these nuclear weapons, but we as the US can have many to destroy the world many times over. It's just, it's really sad. I do really wonder, maybe it's time for us to rethink the concept of America mm -hmm. and maybe consider something different. What do you think? Um, Coming from a country where um, human rights are not that respected, mm -hmm. um, I think I have um, a view that the U.S. situation is better than, say, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I come from. So I tend, most of the time, to compare like, yeah, how human rights issues are handled in this country mm -hmm. and the country where I grew up. So I come up with this idea that it's better here. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I kind of agree that it's regressed. I'm not sure um, that it has anything more to do with the lack of fire um, amongst human beings to fight for their rights. I think for a long time, um, the civil rights movement specifically, there was such a fire to fight for what people thought that they deserved as human beings. And I think that with, you know, the 40-hour work week and uh, overtime, and, and like you said in, in your talk about, we're too busy to be a part of the revolution. Mm -hmm. And I think we allow that to sit within us and allow it to affect um, our work towards change. I think you're bringing up important uh, issues. And I think also what I think it speaks is that we tend to compare, and I think maybe what we want to do is be relational, right? Because if we say if we compare Congo to the U.S., we might think, oh, it's better here, but we might see what's happening in Congo is actually related to the U.S. Right? It's the U.S. imperialism that creates the conditions in Congo. Does that make sense? It's the U.S. imperialist interests or European interests that create conditions otherwhere that lead to these kind of situations. So I think we need to look at things in a relational way, like how does the U.S. imperialism create human rights violations in other places because it impoverishes those things through colonial domination that changes how people would operate. If you look at native communities, we could say, oh, things are, are problematic in different communities. Well, yeah, that's because you took all the land. Of course, <laughs> that makes things worse. Does that make sense? So I think when we look at the, I think when we look at, we can't look just compare countries to each other. We have to look at it on a global scale and saying, how are these relationships creating disparities, globally speaking, and not in just one particular place? Thank you. I might not see you again before you leave on campus. Okay. Well, Wonderful thank you. presentation. Great message. Thank you. Challenge this. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's me. Oh, no, wait. That is. It's me? Yeah. Oh. Well, I kind of don't want to ask that question. <laughs> um, okay, my next question is um, Do you believe that the genocide against the Native peoples of, of the United States? have been pushed aside because of America's um, em new and emerging problem with people from Mexico moving across the border illegally? Well, um, I think that's one component. I guess we look at the relationality of these things, but yeah. we have to look at the genocide in a larger global relationship, right? I mean, if we look at how the U.S. formed itself, um, uh, the genocide is necessary for the U.S. to feel like it has a legitimate rela a claim to this land. Right, native peoples always must be disappearing because if they're not disappearing, then you ask, well, why isn't this native people's land, right? So mm -hmm. the genocide is just necessary um, to even have basic U.S. legitimacy. And I think when we look at the issues of um, border violence, that's a continuing example of that, where uh, we need to make the U.S. borders the real borders, right, that will then make the borders of indigenous nations invisible. But it gets even bigger than this because then this presumes that we should live by borders at all, right? So the U.S. nation state, it's not just its, in partic its particular status, 
but it requires certain things to be not questioned, and that would be such things as borders or absolute control over territory, et cetera. And so I think the issue of border violence is that. And so if you look at, um, in Arizona in particular, there's a lot of indigenous groups fighting SB 1070 and border violence, and they're doing it from an indigenous perspective. They're saying, you know, prior to colonization, we didn't have these borders. People moved across the hemisphere, and the border is there to separate indigenous peoples from their own relatives, you know, and, and so th what they're asking for is not just, you know, pathways to citizenship, but questioning the border itself as the best way that we should organize the way we live with each other. And particularly with tribes that or live over the borders, right, they're just cut in half, and then you start to see the violence of the border itself. I'm just, I just hate talking to you. What do you all think? <laughs> Let me have a hug. I don't think we could actually have a conversation. I'm just curious what your all analysis is. Well, I guess I'll start since I asked the question. Yeah. Um, I'm not actually really sure. Like, the question came to me because I was reading, we were reading Congress in um, our senior seminar class, Women, Gender, and Studies. And it was just something I was thinking of because you were talking about, I don't even remember. Oh, you were talking about it was connecting to like the environmental movement. And how, when you know the, the colonialists, you know, push native peoples into these parcels of land, and how these lands are, you know, very tox toxic and not heavy. I mean, not healthy for people to live on. And then all the rates of like lupus and just all all the terrible diseases that are associated with you know these dump sites. I just kept thinking of okay, what what happened, you know? And then I thought of the borders, and it's like the fluidity of it, it's like what happened to that. Then I thought, you know, was that originally a natural, you know, defined border? Or was it people moving back and forth? So that's what made me think of the question. I, I don't really have a opinion. I just wanted to ask. What do you think? I think uh, the genocide against native peoples has always been heavy. Um, it's always been a conversation we weren't allowed to have, you know. Um, we studied Howard Zinn early on in, in my undergraduate career, and studying a man who we held up as this hero, mm -hmm. right, for his having found America, right, um, who, you know, did all of this heinous mm -hmm. removal and murder of so many people everywhere else, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we don't discuss that in history class. We, d we don't discuss um, much about mm -hmm. Native peoples either, not the truth. Um, so I don't think that there's necessarily any change because there's a problem with illegals or um, Mexican immigrants, mm -hmm. but that it's just, it's always been something that we don't talk about because we don't want to admit that this country is at fault and it still is. What do you think about the creation of different kind of nation states within the African context, how that, the politics of that? Um, I think we have a lot of um, issues that would, that would not allow um, Africa to unite as mm -hmm. one nation. And until we deal with those issues, some of them are very difficult to solve. Mm -hmm. I think that's just impossible. Do you think, um, though, the, um, in other words, how do you think the boundaries would be different had there not been European conquests? Does that make sense? In other words, there might be di differences in groups, but would they fit the boundaries of the current state system there? Um, <clears throat> I think um, the, the problem of borders mm -hmm. has created a, a lot of conflicts, mm -hmm. and we can see it even now. Let's take, for example, the, the conflict between the Congo mm -hmm. and Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Rwanda has always, uh, okay, there are um, people originally from Rwanda mm -hmm. that live in the Congo uh, around the border, mm -hmm. and those people claim to be from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. But you ask yourself, why did the colonialists um, create um, those borders in a, in a way such that people from Rwanda were brought into the Congo. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem that is happening now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a similar yeah. Yeah. The question. Okay. Um, 
I think that within my generation, there seems to be a growing cynicism that human rights are simply too big to solve, and that nothing we do creates a great deal of change. What advice do you have for how to tackle such issues without going cynical, and what do you think we as college students can do to bring about change? Well, there's so much in that. There's one, the human rights paradigm itself, we might question. I think there's, I don't know if you've read Randall Williams, Divided Rights, Human Rights and Its Violence. So, yeah, so that's, I think, one we would look at the human rights model itself. I think Denise De Silva has a good book on that. The problem is the human itself. It's under kind of Western philosophy. The, we, we've already defined the human as essentially a white European subject to begin with, right? And then we develop a rights regime around that that's based on, again, the self is radically separate from everybody else, defines itself over and against everybody else. So there becomes those who have human rights and those who don't. <laughs> There's the hierarchy of who has more than others and who gets to be in charge of things. So I think the human rights paradigm would be something that we would question, which is not to say that we wouldn't do hu engage human rights too, because in other words, there's no pure thing to work with that's not tainted with something. So we do human rights around boarding schools because like also. <laughs> That a question I feel like you should answer. Like, what do you think? <laughs> oh, if I had that answer. <laughs> was, or what, do, what are the specific challenges you think that face college students? Oh, I, um, I kind of agree with the, not the cynicism, I guess mm -hmm. that's not the proper term, but after so many doors have been shut in your face and, and how many times you've had a great deal of support mm -hmm. and you've done something really incredible and there was a little bit of change and then mm -hmm. you move on to the next project and all of that support dwindles. Mm -hmm. I think um, staying dedicated and excited when you're so exhausted mm -hmm. is really difficult. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the difficulties? I think for me it would be not to get overwhelmed because there's so many issues I want to like attach myself to, and I was like, you know, we gotta end sexism, we gotta end racism, we gotta stop the, you know, the prison industrial problems, we gotta fix the broken criminal justice system, we have to fix Africa, like, there's so many issues, and you're just like, it can be overwhelming, and then, like, there gets also to a point where it's like, okay, how, how am I coming at this issue? Am I coming at this issue as a place of privilege because I'm educated, because I'm a Westerner, female who's like, oh, I'm gonna come into you and be all like, this is how you have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's just not getting overwhelmed and then always constantly checking myself to make sure that I'm not like, this is the only way you can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, I have a question on this same, mm -hmm. this same topic. Um, do you think that the current generation in the United States um, needs to like create another movement like that of the 60s, I mean the civil rights movement mm -hmm. to solve current problems? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I mean, I would say, I don't think it has to be like the 60s. Like I hope we could learn from <laughs> the okay. mistakes. It yes. might look at something totally different, right? But we would want, what we do need to do is build movements, right? It's not enough to just work with people who think like you, you have to have movements that grow and grow and bring more people who don't think like you. And I think that's what's been lost with the nonprofit system, that we get very content with a, you know, activist work or advocacy work, where we work with people who agree with us, say, on the death penalty, and we go do a protest. But we don't think of how would I get somebody who doesn't, who supports the death penalty to be involved in this. Like, our strategies aren't really geared towards that long-term process. And I think what you're, you're identifying is there's a number, there's actually, I think with college, so I, so I guess what we, our challenge is, wherever we are, we have unique challenges, but also unique opportunities. <laughs> and then we try to figure out how to maximize them, right? So, so we are identifying as the, the students, in some ways have a little more free time in some respects, right? Like a little more flexibility than if you have like a nine to five job kind of thing. Um, you also have the, um, a chance often to be with people in different parts of the country or different parts of the world to hear ideas that maybe somebody else wouldn't who's in one very geographically confined locale. So there's, you get new ideas to try out. So there's kind of exciting things. You can use funding from the school sometimes. So there's cool things you can do. But, but then some of the challenges are you're also trying not to flunk out of school. <laughs> um, you're also uh, 
sometimes you're, you're isolated from the nearby community, right? So that can lead to the complex you're talking about where you don't really know what's going on in the community because often the college will set that up, right? Don't talk to them, they might like rob you or something. So, don't, so there's not that tight relationship. And then the university uh, sees you as transient. Like they think, well, if you have a big protest, we'll wait for yours and it'll be gone. <laughs> You know what I mean? So they can have a weighted out thing. So there's a challenge of developing a permanent infrastructure that keeps on going even when you individual students leave, you know. So I don't think those are the things I think, but maybe what it is is just making that conscious. Like I think when I've been involved in student organizing or when I see student organizing, people don't think of what is the larger unique opportunities, constraints, and how do we actually work around them. People just tend to do the thing that they think of. <laughs> Let's do a death penalty protest. They don't think, well, how would we keep the death penalty going after we graduate? Like, what's the infrastructure? What's the community base that we're going to have so that there's going to be more continuity because the community people are going to stay there, right? So if we had a tighter community base, then the students could come and go without losing all the information that happens when people graduate. Does that make sense? But at the same time, take advantage. Like, there could be a cool thing where we'd say, hey, we're all here. Next summer, we're all going back home. This is what we'll do when we go back home. We're all going to put this united message <laughs> And disperse it throughout the country. That would be a cool thing that not people get to do a lot of times, right? So I think there's good things. And also when you're talking about burnout, that's just, I think part of it when you're saying I like, get depressed, I think you just want, if you accept that 90% of things you do will fail, then you can have more inner peace. I think, I remember that when I was first starting, nothing worked at all. I'm like, I'm going home. <laughs> but anyway, I kept going with it. But the, the, when something finally worked, it worked because I learned from all the other mistakes. And it took a long time. Like, I did tr tr do a lot of tr trial and error emphasis on major error <laughs> before it started to say, oh, this might work. <laughs> Does that make sense? So if you just start to think of your, if you embrace your failures as actually the thing that's going to help you later on and not get discouraged, then, then now when I fail, I don't really, think, I don't get depressed anymore. I just think, oh, what did I learn from that, right? Because you, you end up with a longer vision of what your trajectory is going to be. It's not dependent on whether or not that one protest works, right? That, I mean, I can just give you one example here. Here's an example. It's, um, when I was in Warren, Chicago, we ended up in this horrible situation where we were, we were trying to protest the 1992 celebrations because there's this huge hoopla to celebrate Columbus in there. So the Italians basically paid off all the heads of the Indian agency. I, don't put this in either, okay? But I'm just telling you for the okay, case. Sorry, I don't want to get piss more people off. But anyway, so they, um, so basically, then they were all yelling at us because they wanted to go. They, they were promised a trip to Italy if they would march in the Columbus Day Parade. But this is just very sad. But anyway, we, we continued with our protest, and they, oh, we just got skewered. I mean, they were just so mad. And other Native people were just so mad for us uh, doing this. And it was just drama, drama, drama. We would just feel so discouraged, you know. So we left. The group didn't continue to exist that much longer afterwards. You would just feel like 100% failure. But then 10 years later, my sister went back to Chicago. And they go, you're the people who stopped the Columbus Day Parade. Like, they remembered it whole completely differently. And then they, even though the group didn't exist, they decided to take on the work that group had done and got dispersed amongst all the Indian agencies that had resisted doing that work before. Does that make sense? So it seemed like a f total failure when you look back, it looked very successful. Does that make sense? So sometimes you don't know what's going to happen unless you keep going and seeing the long-term effects of things. All I say is keep it up <laughs> and have fun. <laughs> Um, what has been the most challenging part of your work, and what has been the most satisfying success? Um, well, I don't know. If, I mean, I, I mean, it's hard to answer because everything's a challenge. Because well, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and heteropatriarchy are the biggest challenges. Oh, it's it's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, those just continue to influence not just the larger situation, but the way we interact with each other, and it's just, and it's even the way we individually act. That's just always a constant challenge. And then the success, I guess I don't see success individually. Does that make sense? I just see it as a collective thing, and I don't know that what the success is even in the longer term thing. So I guess I don't really think of failure and success. It's more like it's an ongoing struggle that I'm part of a larger collective project. I try to keep my part going. <laughs> but so I is there anything in particular you've, you've accomplished with the group or with uh, Yeah, I guess else? I don't. I mean, I guess, but I don't look at it mm -hmm. like that. Does it, 
You know what I mean? I just, because I, I think I got, I think when I did divest from the nonprofit system where it's like, did you win a campaign? But if you get out of the campaign model, the short term model, and you're thinking this is a hundred year battle, not a one year battle, then you're not, does that make sense? You're not thinking in that kind of way. And I remember one guy I saw on television, he was talking, he was like a conservative um, Republican, I think, and he was saying, well, why are you more successful than liberals? And he said, because liberals organize for the next election and we organize for the next 50 years. And that's kind of how I think, I think it more longer term than short term kind of successes, you know. Because sometimes a short term success turns into a failure too. Does that make sense? Like I would say some of the anti-violence stuff seemed like a success <laughs> then a bit as later, right? And some of the things that seemed like, like I just mentioned, it seemed like a miserable failure I felt end up being a success mm -hmm. later on. So I feel like maybe I'm not even gonna be the judge of what is a failure and success in the long term. <laughs> How about you? Has there been any big things you've been involved on campus? That um, I co-founded um, the Committee to End Rape on Campus. Mm -hmm. um, and in our beginning stages, we were about um, 40 faculty and students who were just really pissed off mm -hmm. and really engaged in doing some things. And um, we did a homegrown um, sexual assault production. Mm -hmm. um, theater professor wrote it, and we took students um, stories from campus or from rapes that had occurred on campus mm -hmm. and kind of molded them differently and changed some things around and put that on as a freshman orientation program. Mm -hmm. um, and they responded well and we had something like 60 or 80 faculty mm -hmm. members go into the dorms mm -hmm. with first year students and um, talk with them and kind of do a, a post conversation after mm -hmm. the production. And I think that's the first time that faculty has really interacted with students that way mm -hmm. and kind of seen where we live, how we live, how we respond to things of that nature. Um, you know, and they sat on the floor and talked to us and it was a very uh, on a same level kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. and I think that was a, a really great success for us. Um, well, for me it's different from Catherine because Catherine started things. I just I kind of go in with existing groups. I do a, a lot of work with the Student Government Association, mm -hmm. and so I'm like their policy helper in group. So I'll like look at policy and I'll be like, no, legally, this is illegal. <laughs> you know? So I do a lot of the legal jargon. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this and see how much trouble Bria could potentially get in. <laughs> so that's kind of what I do. Any miserable failures? We yeah. tried to, um, do the production um, the year following. Uh, I didn't have as much support from faculty or students, and um, we. Uh, oh, I sent out an email to the president of the college concerning a different matter, but um, I brought up the, the production that we had done. And I feel like I responded out of emotion, and it wasn't it wasn't the um, most fantastically worded email about it. Mm -hmm. um, and he took it to to mean that I didn't think that it worked instead of. What I was really trying to say was, we had a great first run, but here's what we can improve. Mm -hmm. um, so the second time around, they didn't approve our, our request mm -hmm. um, to do it, and they brought someone else in, which, which was fantastic because we still had a, a freshman orientation program centered on sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still working towards getting something that's homegrown, that's free, that will, like you said, be lasting mm -hmm. for over the next 25 years mm -hmm. um, to keep students informed about what happens here and what their options are. Can you do stuff that doesn't require their consent? Um, for an orientation program, no, because um, here it's like a it's like a four day orientation, and they're scheduled back to back. I mean, we've done protests and uh, rallies. We do like uh, first year that we were involved um, as a group, we did like an information mm -hmm. sheet. You know, one in four women are sexually assaulted mm -hmm. um, during their college aged years, and and did things like hang them up in bathrooms and on poles and things of that nature. And we we're working on a couple of projects, but we haven't done anything on that scale. What about like guerrilla theater? I don't think we've, we, I, I personally, a challenge for me is working in coalition with those who stand against me. Okay. Um, I, I am all for that. I'm the second wave, you know, <laughs> march where I'm not supposed to kind of girl, but um, I'm, I'm learning, working to learn to work in coalition with people who don't think like I okay. do. And to get people out rallying who aren't the ones that come every time, who don't already have this mindset, mm -hmm. but um, to teach and educate those that, 
the dog. So there was a one model, like I was just thinking of um, Sister to Sister, they did is they wanted to make, you know, Brooklyn a violence free zone. So they would just, they would, they would just do the theater on the street itself, like people were walking by and they would have one person harass another person. And then they would stop, you know, why didn't you intervene? Like, does that make sense? Like, there's other creative ways to do the theater that got everybody involved and engaged, you know. So I think when powers would be saying no, you just don't really listen to them. Don't, they don't put that in either, but it's just <laughs> <laughs> to keep me from getting too much trouble, please. I have again. But um, you know, I mean, you could, you gotta got work around. Like, you may not be in the formal structure, but there's always some other way to get 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 things out. I think that's what could get discouraging, especially on anti-rape stuff. Because a lot of times it's always geared towards changing the, the school policy, which is very slow and they don't care it's a lot mm -hmm. of times. Yeah. But, but you know, there's stuff you could do. Like, you know, if there's in the dorm room, there's an assault, people could do something about it without contact the authorities. Like this happened in one group in Oregon. It was a native group and one of the, the men raped one of the women who were in the group. And the, the person who wouldn't do anything. And normally people get discouraged and they said, fine, they, were, they kicked him out of themselves. And then they went and followed him to where his, his tribal community talked to the elders and, and arranged an accountability for him there. And they just followed him. And, and that was without any, um, you know, actually, a, 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 not only did the university not do anything, they were hostile to them, but they just went and did it and made it happen. Yeah, on the policy side, <laughs> it's definitely hard, and it's definitely slow, and I definitely had a, a legal off with the college president mm -hmm. where I was two seconds away from calling the Kentucky Bar Association myself and telling them to look into him because I don't think he's been certified in a couple years. But I slowed down and I'm slowly working to chip away at the policy, even though it is confusing. And I mean, and I think that's important work. It's not like we shouldn't do that work, but you know what I'm saying? Don't put one, all one's eggs in one basket, right? Mm -hmm. You may have to delete most of what I said. <laughs> that's quite I think everything's great. I can do that. Well, I mean, I can talk all day, but you don't want me to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, did you have a time limit that you wanted? Because it's already oh, yeah, 30 actually, minutes. So. Yeah, maybe five more minutes. Okay, uh -huh. so do you want to ask another question? Um, can you walk? Sure. Um, to what extent do you think cultural and gender differences play in instigating violence? Well, I don't think it's different. I think it's power imbalances. So, I mean, I think, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's, like, we tend to have this multicultural approach. Where this group doesn't understand this group, but it's really about who's got all the power and who, who doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's about ch violence and abuse happens when there's a major power imbalance. It's about changing those power imbalances. I mean, it's not like Native groups did not not get along with each other, right? But when they were on a more or less equal plane, one group couldn't take over another group, or didn't, that wasn't their intent, right? But when you have one group that can actually annihilate another group, that's when you have the problem. Um, do, do you have any, any particular source of inspiration that guides you into doing the work that you're involved in? Well, I mean, I am a Christian, so I have that, that as a basis. Um, I, I, went, you know, I went to Union Seminary, and I was trained by James Cohn, who um, is kind of like the founder of Black Liberation Theology. So he was a key inspirational person for me of how you could put the two together. And uh, um, yeah, and also, I guess, the inspiration of just people's work, right? Like it's a collective work, and you feel like you're part of something beyond yourself. So no matter how much I screw up, <laughs> Thankfully, the revolution doesn't depend on me being perfect, because <laughs> otherwise we would be sunk. So, for, you know, but but there's the the wisdom of all of you here, right? Like all of you has much to say as I do, and so that inspires me that I know that you're doing all this great work here, and that we can still be connected afterwards. And that we're all, you know, I mean, we all you get you get discouraged by the, the bad things that happen, but there's all the little good things you kind of take for granted that you can know that people are there wanting to make the world a better place and even with the disagreements we're more on the same side than not Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so I guess those would be key things you know and that's not like I no, don't have moments of discouragement but even when I get discouraged I have other people who help through those moments of discouragement and I, even that's part of the process too I think mm -hmm. you don't have to feel um, peppy all the time <laughs> You know, we can have the moments where you say, oh, this is sucks, I'm going to go watch Lifetime television for three weeks until I recover. You know, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> How about you?
How about you all? Um, what, what got me started, I think, in activist work, um, most of the women in my life have been victims of abuse or violence in one way or another, um, primarily sexual. And I think um, not until I got to college did I know about most of it, things that had happened in my family, things that happened to my friends, um, and then uh, immediately, of course, what was happening to college-age women. Um, and the more I learned, the more pissed off I got, mm -hmm. and the more I wanted to do something about it. Um, so I just did as much research as I could, and as much reading as I could, and I think um, little bouts of change here and there, or um, you know, new new programs on college campuses mm -hmm. that work, or or um, stories of a woman who fended off her rapist, or a woman who reported her abusive husband, things of that like of that nature keep me going, knowing that. Um, even if I'm not changing a campus, maybe I changed one person's experience. How about you? Um, I think for me, it's just the acknowledgement of the struggle of being a black woman in this nation state called America. And like, listen, and reading the stories of my foremothers and just seeing all they went through and just being grateful for the experiences and opportunities that I have and knowing that not everyone had the opportunities I did and just wanting to make, you know, at least one person, like at least one young black woman, like her life better to where she can be like, you know, I don't, I don't have to, you know, sell my body. I can, you know, get educated and I can help someone else. So that, that's my inspiration. Um. I didn't know much about the field of social justice until I started my studies here in Berea. But when I look at the situation back home, I feel like I have the obligation to do something. And the classes that I've taken in the, f uh, in the peace and social justice um, field have been such, a, such an eye-opening to me I have learned um, various um, movements of um, non-violence activism, mm -hmm. and I think I can draw from those experiences, like um, from people like Gandhi, people like um, Martin Luther King, that started as ordinary people, but achieved something great. And I think, yeah, I can do it too. I can contribute towards um, the change of things in the world and in my society. Yeah. Well, I'm very inspired by you all. Well, we'll all right. Keep in touch. It's been very nice talking with you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay.